Hello friends, welcome to yet another episode of Pulmonology Read Aloud. Today, as promised last time, we will be talking about mycophenolate mofetil. We will try to understand what, as a pulmonologist, we all must know about this drug, which has now lot of implications, indications in respiratory diseases, that is interstitial lung diseases. So let's get started. The paper that I'm going to be reviewing is uh, a specific paper on the role of mycophenolate in interstitial lung diseases and uh, proudly we have Indian authors as well in this paper. So let's try and understand where we can use this drug and what are the side effects, the complications as well as the benefits of giving this drug. This is a slide from my previous talk, my previous video, where I spoke about uh, ILDs from uh, connective tissue diseases and rheumatic diseases. And this is a very important slide because it kind of summarizes that mycophenolate has indication in most rheumatic as well as other connective tissue diseases, uh, including systemic sclerosis, myositis, MCTD, rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren syndrome. So it is one drug that has clearly shown its mantle against most other immunosuppressants, mainly because you can use it um, on in your setup with more confidence that the side effects will be less. And there is more and more research data showing that it is a very wonderful and useful drug. Now, uh, when we talk about the use of mycophenolate, there is uh, a very strong indication of this drug, which is in connective tissue disease, scleroderma, or systemic sclerosis, because this is one disease where, as I highlighted in my previous video, there is a strong recommendation against starting glucocorticoids upfront. We have to start with immunosuppression. And if you look at the first line therapies that are available, Mycophenolate is clearly a much easier alternative as compared to tocilizumab and rituximab. Hence, uh, this drug is important, uh, especially in sardile. So this is a bar chart taken from the paper, which basically tells us about the spectrum of ILDs in India requiring treatment uh, taken from prospective studies. The gray area is the PGI Chandigarh registry. Uh, according to which sarcoidosis is the predominant type of interstitial lung disease that we encounter. Uh, the orange one is the ILD India Registry of 2016, according to which hypersensitivity pneumonitis is the predominant ILD. And there is this Eastern India experience of 2014, which has uh, almost similar uh, prevalence of IPF and connective tissue disease ILD. So talking about mycophenolate mofetil now, it is an immunosuppressant. It is a versatile immunosuppressant because it has indications in many, many conditions, including uh, to prevent graft versus host rejection, chronic allograft rejection. So it has a lot of indication in renal transplant and other transplant patients. The way it works is that mycophenolate mofetil is a prodrug of mycophenolic acid. And mycophenolic acid um, is the one that is a potent inhibitor of lymphocyte proliferation. So we must remember that mycophenolic acid will inhibit lymphocytes. So that is brought about through non-competitive selective and reversible inhibition of inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase enzyme in the stimulated lymphocytes. So not only does it block the de novo synthesis of GMP products, guanosin nucleotides, uh, through which it causes an immunosuppressant effect, it can induce apoptosis of human T lymphocytes and it can inhibit proliferation of these lymphocytes so it can prevent further progression to fibrosis. 
this is not from the paper but i just took this uh, screenshot for us to understand better then when we talk about uh, mycophenolate the inhibition is at imp to xmp which further prevents the production of gtp and these in a sense will cause uh, inhibition of these cytokines and so it will deplete the gmp in tnb lymphocytes it will inhibit the proliferation of the lymphocytes so it will suppress the cell mediated immune response and it will also suppress antibody formation it's actually five fold more potent an inhibitor of imp dh type 2 uh, enzyme which is expressed in activated lymphocytes so it is the one that has more potent cytostatic effect than uh, on these lymphocytes than other cell types so this causes not only immunosuppressive effect but it also causes an anti-inflammatory anti-proliferative and anti-fibrotic effect because it also decreases expression of other factors like tgf beta and hence for the treatment of ilds like hp sarcoid ctt ilds uh, it can intervene in this pathogenesis which involves cytokines growth factors tnb cells fibroblasts activated macrophages and hence it can inhibit many of these mediators and pathways let's talk about the dosing recommendations of mmf because it's very important to know the right doses when we start prescribing this drug now the optimal daily dose range of mmf is 1.5 to 3 grams in two divided doses in fact since it comes as 500 milligram tablets hence it can be started from as low as one gram uh, and we can go up to three grams so patients can be given uh, two tablets of mmf initially uh, when you escalate the dose to two grams so two tablets morning evening of 500 milligram and we can go as high as three gram if we have patients who have end stage renal disease then this dose must be reduced also it's very important to tell the patient that it should be either taken 30 minutes before a meal or two hours after the meal a lot of patients have gastric intolerance so they take antacids so they must be told that the antacids should be taken at least two hours apart from the time of intake of mmf and if they are taking any supplements like calcium supplements that also should be taken at least two hours apart after the intake of mmf the optimal duration of treatment again depends on the type of disease that we are seeing however it can be safely continued uh, until the patient is better and there is a stabilization of his lung functions and other parameters a minimum duration of 12 to 24 months is recommended to obtain a good response through this drug when we compare it with other immunosuppressants it has been shown to be a very good first line treatment for systemic sclerosis ild based on the scleroderma lung uh, study too and it has also been seen that if we compare it with cyclophosphamide as initial dose the toxicities in mmf have been much lower so it's much superior with respect to safety again the other immunosuppressant that has been widely compared with mmf is azathioprine and it has been shown that while patients have higher discontinuation rates with azathioprine those with mmf are lower also uh, azathioprine has certain side effects like development of skin cancer which is not there in mmf and if we talk about cyclophosphamide the risk of hemorrhagic cystitis and other toxicity is less unlike azathioprine we also do not require regular monitoring for liver toxicity and um, this is also one benefit of mmf against other immunosuppressants as far as safety is concerned it is a safe and well tolerated drug it achieves a longer peak plasma concentration um, and it is having 
some gastrointestinal and bone marrow suppression as the most commonly adverse adverse effects and amongst these also GI are more common. These adverse effects are mostly dose dependent and they typically occur at the start of the treatment. Once the patient continues the drug, they are usually able to overcome these cha challenges and the most common amongst the GI effects are nausea, vomiting, dyspepsia and abdominal pain. To reduce these GI events and effects, MMF has been substituted or rather I would say there is an alternative that's been there which is mycophenolate sodium. This is an enteric coated tablet and this tablet has been designed to overcome the challenges of MMF. Uh, it comes as a 360 milligram dose and MPS or mycophenolate sodium can be given in 360 milligram if patient is not able to tolerate MMF. Few rare hematological side effects uh, can be mostly related to bone marrow suppression like leukopenia, anemia and thrombocytopenia as well. Now when we talk about drug interactions, co-administration of MMF has to be very careful with especially antiviral compounds like acyclovir uh, and gancyclovir whose toxicity can be increased if MMF is given along with an increased risk of nephrotoxicity, neutropenia and leukopenia. Also, when patient is on MMF, the chances of infection, secondary infections is high and have to be looked at. There are some reports of lymphomas and other malignancies of the skin and it has to be avoided in pregnancy because there will be a risk of congenital anomalies. Normally, complete blood counts can be done weekly for the first month. Then you can do it every fortnightly for the second and the third month and then monthly for the remainder of the first year on treatment with this drug. Let's come to individual indications which have been elaborated in this paper, starting with chronic HP. Now, the evidence of MMF in chronic HP is limited. Usually, it is not the first line and steroids are the first line drugs. What we know, however, of its use in chronic HP through retrospective studies and certain trials is that it stabilizes an otherwise expected lung function decline. So if the patient is not doing well on steroids, this is a good drug to start. It also has better safety profile than steroids. It has a steroid sparing effect. So patients who are on corticosteroids will have a dose reduction once they're switched to MMF. And most of the studies have looked at MMF versus azathioprine as immunosuppressant in chronic HP. Both the drugs have shown improvement in DLCO. Both the drugs have shown a non-significant change in FVC. And however, they both can reduce the steroid dose. If we look at MMF's use over two years, it has been shown that it leads to stabilization of DLCO and FVC in chronic HP in a usual dose of 1 to 3 grams per day. This is a screenshot from the paper where you can see this chart showing the study uh, which was published in ATS 2017 which compared prednisolone versus um, MMF and they found that the dose at the start of prednisolone and at the end of two years was much less at the end of two years with patients on MMF. The DLCO percentage predicted was slightly better in at the end of two years on starting mycophenolate and the FPC showed a non-significant increase. Both uh, mycophenolate and azothioprine cause, um, if you give it with corticosteroids, studies have reported that sometimes in severe cases you might not be able to stop steroids but you can bring them to lowest doses possible. And also the adverse event profile is much better with mycophenolate. In connected tissue diseases, I've already outlined how in scleroderma from the scleroderma lung study, it has been concluded that there's a very good evidence to start mycophenolate. Uh, usual dose is 2 grams a day in divided dose in this group. There have been studies which have compared mycophenolate versus cyclophosphamide in this group and have noted an improvement in FPC, dyspnea score, and skin thickness with both but the safety profile as I said is much better in mycophenolate and the other benefit is 
that it causes a sustained stabilization of lung function even up to 36 months as compared to cyclophosphamide. In terms of other CTD ILDs, the safety and tolerability again has been seen in large group of patients with diverse spectrum as I mentioned in my first slide on starting. It has shown a significant improvement in FBC in other CTD ILDs also in studies which have followed up patients up to 156 weeks and especially in the group subgroup with non-UIP pattern. There also it has shown a stabilization in FVC and DLCO and an improvement in and stability of the CTD ILD regardless of the underlying ILD subtype. With persistent symptomatic relief within two to six weeks of treatment and then uh, once it has an increase in activity levels it causes stabilization and improvement in CTD ILD. So it's a very good drug to start in these cases. They've also reported that in ILDs with Sjogren syndrome and autoimmune features, MMF could be a very good drug to start with. It also has a significant role in polymyositis and dermatomyositis as ILD and it has been shown to have a steroid sparing effect in dermatomyositis for skin and muscle manifestations also. Coming to chronic sarcoidosis or refractory sarcoidosis, it can be used as an alternative treatment if patients are intolerant to previous immunosuppressants. It has been seen that patients who were started on MMF because of intolerance to previous immunosuppressive therapy, they show an improvement in DLCO and FPC at 12 months. So again, when you have chronic sarcoid or refractory sarcoid, uh, after the first line agents are not tolerated, you could start micro. The next indication is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, this paper has looked into certain retrospective studies that have been done in patients diagnosed with IPF and treated with MMF versus triple therapy and no therapy at all. And they have observed that patients who received mycophenolate had worse baseline FVC and yet at the end of 12 months, the patients who received mycophenolate showed lesser decline in FVC compared with other two arms. And we already know from the PANTHER trial that the triple drug arm for IPF is no longer recommended. So it definitely this drug is a good drug to start even in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis along with um, antifibrotics. Certain studies have looked into whether MMF plus Nintadanib has shown a better improvement compared to Nintadanib alone and it has in certain idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or UIP pattern ILDs as well. So to conclude, mycophenolate is a very viable immunosuppressant agent which already is being used in many ILDs and it has a role in a spectrum of ILDs with safety which is better than most immunosuppressant that we use. With that, I conclude the series on interstitial lung diseases. I would be switching gears to another topic very soon and I would recommend and request you to kindly pour in your comments on the videos that you would like in the future in the comment section. Till then, happy reading. Please do subscribe, like and share Pulmonology Read Aloud and share it with your friends. Thank you and have a nice day.